to today's uh, talk with Michael Christie. We're very excited to see you all here. This is the first event in our four-part author series called Big Names Little City, so make sure to grab yourself one of the handbills on the table there at the end to find out when uh, Susan Juby, Eve Joseph, and Billy Ray Belcourt will be visiting later this year. So we'd like to begin by acknowledging the life that the library and this reading series take place of the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Sununu First Nation. Siatala Tatsunemo Mastimo Ni Hakwashos Tataba Atanakweo. We give our highest gratitude and appreciation to the people of Sununemo for allowing us on their territory. Vancouver Island Regional Library is committed to making a positive contribution to the reconciliation process, as well as providing a space for Indigenous voices. The topics of climate challenge and crisis are featured in Michael Christie's book, Greenwood, um, and they're intimately connected to the topics of decolonization and indigenous nations. So let's keep that in mind with our discussions today. Uh, we'd like to extend our sincere thanks to our partners and sponsors for the Big Names Little City series. So the Federation of BC Writers is very generously offering their members as moderators for us. Uh, local independent bookstore, Window Seat Books, is doing book sales. And the city of Nanaimo has provided us with much needed funding through the Downtown Revitalization Events Grant. Um, please just note that today's event is being recorded. Um, the camera is just located right over to uh, my left, your right. Um, the camera's viewfinder is only including the speaker's area, though, so no one in the audience uh, will be captured. So without further ado, let's please welcome today's moderator, Madeline Natras, who will introduce Michael. originally from Thunder Bay and now lives on Yariyama Island. He's had a professional <coughs> career as a skateboarder, studied psychology, and worked in social services before pursuing creative writing, as you can see. I've not had the pleasure of reading Greenwood yet, but I have read Michael's debut novel, If I Fall, I Die. It's a fascinating story set in Thunder Bay about an agoraphobic mother and her son and explores very timely issues of privilege and homelessness and racial prejudice. Not surprisingly, it enlightened my limited knowledge about skateboarding. <laughs> and Greenwood promises to be just as original. This is just one of the many reviews of Greenwood written by Claire author of The Last of Mandazol. She says, Greenwood is brilliant. Michael Christie shows a cross-section of one family's history, revealing their dark secrets, loves, losses, and the mark of an accident still visible four generations later. She goes on to say, I had to cancel everything for this book because I couldn't stop reading. Michael has agreed to take questions after the reading, and there will be an opportunity to purchase books after this session. Please join me in welcoming Michael Christie and Greenwood. Thank you very much, Madeline, and thank you, Stain. 
Shannon and Casey for setting all of this up. It's wonderful to be here. Although I would change one thing. Uh, if you can make it uh, Little City Medium Names, that <laughs> would appeal to my own modesty. Uh, um, I, I always do readings in uh, libraries whenever anyone asks me, um, mainly because as a kid, uh, uh, I grew up, uh, my mother was significantly mentally ill, she was agoraphobic, she couldn't really leave the house, but one of the places that she could go was the public library. Her friend would drive us there every weekend, and her and I would spend time there, uh, and that was where my writing career and reading career began. So uh, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here today. We have a funny, I live on Galliano Island, we have a funny library there. It's very small, uh, it's, it's, it's very well used, um, and, 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 and it also has uh, free Wi-Fi 24 hours a day. Uh, the Wi-Fi extends beyond the uh, reaches of the library's walls. So if you go there at night, uh, you can see people parked in their cars <laughs> out front of the library with Netflix open <laughs> on their lap. Uh, it was sort of like a modern take on the drive-in theater, uh, which I love. So thank you to libraries. Um, I'm going to be focusing mainly on Greenwood today, uh, just because it's new, and I pretty much forget everything that is in my other books. Um, it is a uh, multi-generational epic story. I've always loved big family stories, big novels that feel like worlds that you can sink into, um, stories that tell uh, you know multiple generations. And interrelation between generations, all of these things I was very much interested in while I was writing this book. So it was also the first time I had full-time writing, uh, the, the ability to write full-time and not work another job. So I was sort of said to myself, well, I might as well uh, put the time to good use. And uh, so four years later, uh, I made a door stopper. Um, so it centers on the Greenwood family, uh, four generations of the Greenwood family who may or may not uh, actually be related. I'll leave that to you to figure out as you read. Um, and its structure is kind of unusual. Um, the, let me show you. The, it's told in a series of nested uh, sections. And it begins in the future. So this is the, this is the index of the book. Um, it's told, it begins with the outer ring of the story, which is set in the near future, and then travels back through the tree, the family tree, uh, to 2008, to 1974, to 1934, to 1908 when the family began, uh, and then back out through those rings again to the end of the book, which is here. So it's sort of like a series of nested narrative dolls, almost like Russian dolls fitting together. Um, and this idea came to me when I, this sounds unenvironmental of me, but I was cutting down a tree. Uh, <laughs> it had to go. It was partially diseased. Um, and I cut the tree down and I looked at the stump um, and, I, and I, it sort of occurred to me in a flash that a tree is a kind of story in the sense that it's recording time. And I got interested in plant biology and trees in general, and I you know, learned that you know, there are scientists who can actually tell the weather of a particular year through tree ring dating, um, uh, you know, droughts. You can see the Great Depression in the majority of trees in Canada. Uh, so it's a fascinating subject, and it's the subject of Greenwood. Um, so I'm going to read, it's a difficult book to read from, uh, partially because there's so many characters and there's so many interconnections. Um, but I'm going to begin with the 2034 section, uh, which is uh, set on an island um, called Greenwood Island. Actually, it's not Galliano Island, I'll tell you. I'm going to be run off the island if, uh, if I make that assumption. Um, so uh, in, in the main character of the section is uh, Jake Greenwood, whose real name is Jacinda. Uh, she is a very accomplished tree biologist, tree researcher, 
um, who after the, what's called the Great Withering has happened, um, which is sort of a, an environmental collapse where the majority of the planet's trees uh, become diseased in an unknown way, in a way that people can't figure out and die. Um, and so Jake has been reduced to working on the, sort of the last, one of the last stands of old growth trees, which has been turned into a resort where the wealthy of the world can come to bathe in the forest while everyone else sort of across the globe is uh, wallowing in, in dust. So I'll begin there. A few more things you need to know. When I say pilgrims, that means that that's what they call the people who come to this place, and it's called the Greenwood Arboreal Cathedral. Um, also, when trees are gone, paper is in short supply, so she's going to be calling a book a paper book instead of a book. I'm leaving tonight, Silas says, but I've been cleared to entrust this with you until I return. So you don't need to make any decisions about whether to proceed with your claim now. In fact, I'd rather you didn't. I want you to read it. Mull it over. Get used to what it feels like to have a history. Just promise me that you'll take exceptionally good care of this paper book. This is an artifact of tremendous value, most of all to you. I've got a bunch of these on my bedside table already, Jake jokes, attempting to mask her ravenous desire to read the paper book as she presses it along with the index card against her stomach. But I'll try to get to it. Silas shakes his head and grins. We're currently in negotiations to acquire another critical piece of this puzzle, one that would greatly strengthen your claim. And when we do, I'll be back. He draws close and grasps her elbows. I looked into your debt situation, Jake, and I know things are dire, but this could fix everything. And I don't just mean money. You never had much of a story to tell. Always, I always sense that it hurts you, whether you'd admit it or not. Now all that can change. Later that evening, Jake returns to her staff cabin, pours herself a hefty bourbon, and curls into the love seat with the paper book spread in her lap. After five more tours shepherding pilgrims through the cathedral, her eyes are sludgy and unprepared for parsing the book's tricky cursive script. She hasn't seen anyone write in this antiquated fashion for years and never learned the technique in her Delhi elementary school. Just two pages in, Jake's chin begins to dip, thereby unraveling the few narrative fibers that she'd managed to weave together. It was silly to get your hopes up, she tells herself, rising to place the paper book in her father's old cardboard box, filing it away with all her other meaningless family heirlooms. Though she understands this journal is something that ought to have great bearing on her life, unfortunately for Silas and his scheme, Jake has always mistrusted the expression, knowing your roots, as though roots, by their very definition, are knowable. Any dendrologist can tell you that the roots of a mature Douglas fir spread for miles, that they're dark and intertwining, tangled and twisted and impossible to map, that they often fuse together and even communicate, secretly sharing nutrients and chemical weapons among themselves. So the truth is that there exists no distinction between one tree and another, and their roots are anything but knowable. Jake snaps back her drink and retrieves the paper book from the box, flipping to the inside front cover, where she finds facing the first page a splash of crudely penciled words scrawled in a child's block print. Property of Willow Greenwood. Despite her reservations about Silas's true motivation, and her general bafflement with the book's cryptic entries, Jake's heart takes a little skip at the sight of her grandmother's name, however misspelled it may be. And while drinking herself toward a welcome oblivion throughout the evening, she wonders about Willow Greenwood, about who she was and what impelled her to give her fortune away. She wonders about her father and if he also drank, and whether that's what made him trouble. If he did, Jake already forgives him. Maybe she drinks because of his genes, or because of his absence. Or maybe his genes created his absence, which created her drinking. Or maybe he felt just as unwelcome in the world as she does now, 
and drinking was the only thing that allowed him any reprieve. Or maybe her roots are all too tangled, and there's no single story to be told about any of it. Deep in the night, just after she's dragged her cathedral-issue comforter over her body and is preparing to pass out, she lifts the paper book one last time and fans its grimy, hand-inked pages. How intimately a book is related to the tree and its rings, she thinks. The layers of time preserved for all to examine. Recently, I was reading uh, with my son. Uh, it's the thing we do before bed, my younger son. Um, and he's very observant. Um, and uh, it, was, it wasn't that recent. It was before this book came out. And he asked me, how big is your book going to be, Dad? Uh, I said, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Maybe, you know, maybe you know, this big. I'm not sure if they're going to do a hardcover or a paperback. I'm not sure. Maybe it'll be a pocketbook. I don't know. Um, and then he said, uh, what about, isn't, isn't a book actually bigger than that? And I said, what do you mean? Most books are usually this big. And he said, what about all the pages? And I thought about it. And I took out my phone and I did a calculation. And if you take into account of all the pages, the surface area of the pages, the, the, the book is actually larger than his room in surface area. And I said, wow, actually, no, it's bigger than your room. <laughs> and he said, people think books are small, but they're actually huge. <laughs> so um, that is our introduction to um, the, the story. Uh, after that, we dive back into Jake's family history, which is tangled, to say the least, um, and partially unknowable. Um, so she's from her strange, her, her father is, is sort of a stranger to her. She never knew him. Um, all she knows that he was a carpenter um, who uh, uh, mostly lived in his van. Um, uh, and in the 2008 section, uh, we, we get some of his story. And his name is Liam, Liam Greenwood. Um, so I'm gonna read you a very brief snippet from Liam, Liam Greenwood's section. Um, What's happened to him is he's, he's working, he does reclaimed wood carpentry. I'm not sure if anyone knows what this is. Um, uh, but you take old wood uh, that's been weathered and you put it, you install it uh, in coffee shops or in, in his case, it's very, very wealthy people's houses uh, on sort of the, the east coast of the US, so sort of upstate New York kind of thing. Um, but Liam, um, Liam has fallen off a piece of a set of scaffolding. He's by himself. Uh, he's landed on his back and he's hurt himself. And he's laying there and kind of contemplating his life and, remember, and recalling bits of his childhood. So I'm going to read you a brief bit from that. This chapter is titled, A Question. Do you love the forests more than you love me? His mother shifts in the lawn chair she's pulled from the Westphalia to sit by the ocean, running a hand through her salt-tangled hair. They finally made it to the Oregon coast for his 10th birthday, except the water here is black and freezing and the waves are squat and impossible to surf. Liam has spent the afternoon in a funk, crushing between two rocks the purple mussel shells that he finds on the beach. The cold hasn't stopped his mother Willow from skinny dipping all morning, bobbing out there with an armada of bull kelp. He wishes she'd wear the bathing suit he prudishly bought for her with his own money at J.C. Penney, but she hasn't even removed the tags. His question hangs in the air unanswered as she slowly quarters an orange with her opinel and then bites into a wedge. He's asked this question before and knows it annoys her but he repeats it anyway. He needs her answer more than he needs anything else. And perhaps, because it's his birthday, this time, he gets one. You're a good person, Liam, one of the best. But you're just one person, she says, sucking pulp from her teeth and spitting it into the sand. Nature is greater than us all.
So William's mother uh, is named Willow Greenwood, and um, she is a radical environmentalist. Uh, her and her son live in a Westphalia van uh, all the time, and they travel around the Pacific Northwest pouring sugar into the gas tanks of logging equipment. Um, <laughs> maybe some of you have done this. I did a bunch of research. I, I, I did interviews with folks who did this kind of uh, activism. Um, and so, uh, as, as you go through the book, you notice that each generation has its own relationship with both like, with forests and trees and with nature. And so Willows is very much uh, an idealist, ideological relationship. She sees the environmental degradation of the world as a great crime that it, she must do something to prevent. Um, while Liam sees trees as a way to make his living, a way to make his livelihood. Um, and so, and it, it progresses through the book uh, with sort of different ideas as you go. So, I'm gonna jump um, to, it's a bit of a, a, sort of a sampler. It's like a box of chocolates. <laughs> I'm gonna jump to 1934. Um, and this section, is the largest section of the book. Um, it involves a cross-country manhunt. Uh, uh -oh. It services on, uh, it, it takes place during the Depression in Canada, which I did a bunch of research uh, related to that. It features a library, uh, kind of an unusual library in Estevan, Saskatchewan, uh, a, a woman who um, makes meals for the poor, essentially puts together kind of an ad hoc library where people bring books uh, and deposit them. Uh, and the only rule is that you have to put a book in to take one. And so the weirdest and most amazing books come <laughs> uh, along the rail lines, books covered in blood, books with leaves in their pages, books that are new, books that are old, books that are falling apart. And that's part of the, the story as well. I just thought I had to tell that being here. Um, uh, but mostly this section centers on two characters. One of them is Everett Greenwood, and one of them is Paris Greenwood. Everett is a veteran of the First World War. He's a hermit, he's a very damaged person. Um, but this section is going to be uh, focused on his brother, Paris Greenwood, who is a timber tycoon, uh, and who is also blind. Um, but who has built up a massive timber empire in Canada. Uh, Harris is kind of modeled on H.R. McMillan to some degree, uh, but his lawyers are here. <laughs> it's nothing to do with them. Um, I did a lot of research on sort of these, the timber industry, particularly in BC, but also throughout North America. Um, so this scene, Okay, this scene is uh, set in uh, Harris Greenwood's office, um, and he's recently had a strange sound. Uh, he's recently had a uh, request from the Japanese government, this is pre-World War II, to provide them with the lumber to build a gigantic railroad project. Um, and this he really very much wants to do because his business is not doing well at this moment. No one is building anything during the Depression, so he needs this contract. And he's decided to hire a man he's termed as his describer. He needs to go to Japan, he needs someone to be his eyes. Um, and this is the job interview. There's also sort of a secret that Harris himself is almost unaware of about himself that may come through throughout the reading. <clears throat> so far, the applicants have been uniformly lackluster, dim-witted, uninspired, charmless. Yet Harris Greenwood retains high hopes for the final man, recommended by one of his regional mill managers, an Irish poet of some repute who'd come over to log the great Canadian forests. Along with his literary aptitude, he's touted as one of the finest tugboat pilots anywhere. A minute before the man's arrival, Harris knocks over a drinking glass and clips his elbow on a bookshelf that has been there for years. Blunders he attributes to too much tea at lunch, or perhaps to the disorienting absence of his bird collection. 
He had Milner temporarily move the cages into the boardroom so they wouldn't hamper the interviews. Usually, Harris avoids face-to-face -face meetings with strangers. Over the telephone or through the telegraph, people rely on neither facial expressions nor gestures. They fill silences and choose their words carefully. They describe. To Harris, meeting a stranger in person is akin to opening a zoo cage at random. One must be ready for a tiger or a peacock, a rabbit or a wolverine. And, if it, and it's often too late in the game before you figure out which you're dealing with. At the appointed time, Milner escorts Liam Feeney inside. They shake hands across Harris's desk. Feeney's grip is cool, the pads of his fingers thick as felt. He smells of fur pitch, skid grease, the sea, and perhaps, or is Harris's nose off, a touch of French cologne. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Greenwood, sir, Feeney says. Other than his Irish accent, knife-sharp T's and L's that unfurl like a carpet from the back of his tongue. Nothing seems overwhelmingly poetic about his voice, yet it's a clean register with the resonance of an instrument that Harris can't place, a voice that could fill an entire theater with a whisper. Because one of the other applicants may have moved it, Harris resists gesturing to the chair while asking Mr. Feeney to take a seat. Straight away, Harris leaps into an account of his impending journey to Tokyo where he'll be negotiating a contract to supply sleepers to the largest railway company in Japan. This involves sea travel, naturally, Harris says. Does that suit you, Mr. Feeney? Sea travel is my specialty, sir. I will also be bringing along my assistant, Mr. Baumgartner, Harris goes on, who, in addition to being the best faller on the West Coast, is good for a crude appraisal. The sky is gray, these trees are straight, the sun is out, that kind of thing. But what I require is a keener sensibility, someone who recognizes subtlety, humanity, beauty. This last word wrong puts him, and a near cough momentarily stops his airway. With an eye for detail, do you figure yourself to embody these traits, Mr. Feeney? On my good days, sir. Was that flippancy? Your primary role will be to provide me with descriptions, Harris hears himself continue. To be my eyes, in English, I can negotiate the stripes off a zebra. But with this Japanese nonsense to contend with, I'll be lost. Translators only scratch the surface. I need someone to watch faces, track mannerisms, read situations. I've always been an observer, sir, since I was a boy. It's the poet's curse. Was there a smirk to how he said that? More flippancy? Harris needs to get him talking. Have you much experience with the blind, Mr. Feeney? Not much, sir. Only the few relations who temporarily drank themselves there, I'm afraid. <laughs> That's fine, I don't need a nanny, Harris says, comforted by the man's witticism. You'll see I'm quite independent, he says, resisting the temptation to mention his insistence on cutting his own firewood and shaving his own face. So, perhaps a bit more about me, Harris soldiers on. I'm a lumberman, through and through. I've no family, neither, neither wife nor children, no time for such frivolities. I live for my work, and my work is trees, he says before summarizing further a few more of his accomplishments. When he's done, Feeney makes no remark, and Harris dangles over the, abs the abyss of silence, reg regretting bitterly the absence of his bird collection. And why is he telling this man all of this? As though he's the one applying for a position, and not vice versa. He's already offered up more personal detail to this stranger than he has to Baumgartner over their many years together. All this about a lack of a wife and being a lumberman through and through, nonsense. You family yourself, Harris asks, clutching at the cliff's edge. Not to speak of, sir. An auntie back in Cork. A sister who passed before I left. That's the sum of it. Good, good. Why would his not having a family be good? And so what would draw an Irish poet to the woods of Canada? My homeland wasn't agreeable to me, sir too small-minded and cloistered. And working in the forest puts you closer to the heart of things. The money beats poetry besides, Feeney says tightly, and this time Harris can see the smirk. Too true, Harris says knowingly. Why is he addressing him as a fellow poet? What does Harris know of their finances? Sorry. You know, in my time studying forestry at Yale, 
It was said that I had a facile pen, and despite my obvious limitations, I did deep readings of the classics. Does this surprise you? Not in the slightest. You seem a classical type of fellow. Harris risks a gesture to his bookshelf. I've accumulated a good collection of literature. Though I find braille cumbersome, slower paced than the nimble mind, I prefer the music of the human voice. Who doesn't, sir? Much information is contained in the voice, Mr. Feeney, more than the vulgar import of words. There's tone, a person's background, and emotion. Another pause, and Harris has no inkling whether his remarks have landed. Is he being pedantic? Of course a poet knows the subtleties of voice. Along with a describer, Harris continues, I require a man who could breathe life into language, one who can hold my interest. Have you done much public reading as a poet, Mr. Feeney? Here and there, he says noncommittally. This settles it. Harris has grown sufficiently chafed by the glibness of his tone, the lack of snap to his responses. Here and there, Harris retorts, I asked if you've performed many public readings, Mr. Feeney. That's right, sir, you did. And following that, I replied, here and there. Glad we're all caught up. <laughs> Another toe-curling pause. Harris recalls how Everett, as a boy, met the world with a similar mm -hmm. goodness and how it always infuriated him. Now he draws a deep, volcanic breath. I advise you to be careful, Mr. Feeney. Perhaps because you're an artist, you think you're somehow my intellectual superior? That I'm playing the role of the crude industrialist and you, the noble, carefree poet? In my experience, artists often elect to ignore the ironclad fact that without the aid of my lumber, they'd be freezing in the dark with nothing to read but the anguish on the, their children's hypothermic faces. Shakespeare himself would have been a shivering loon writing on the walls of a damp cave with his own urine if it weren't for men like me. <laughs> now he's certain Feeney snickers, which half enrages him, half invites his own laughter. He is being overdramatic, isn't he? His own urine? Or perhaps you suspect a blind man is incapable of running an outfit like mine, Harris says menacingly, leaning forward, his hands pressed to his desk. Outfit, sir. He says, three million in annual revenue hardly qualifies you as an outfit. I'd say you're doing just fine. Harris is so unaccustomed to being addressed with such frankness, he's nearly enjoying it. Those are pre-crash numbers, he says, resting back in his chair and shoving his thumbs into his armpits. But it seems you do know a little bit about me after all. Only the important bits, sir. Such as, well, that you lost your sight in the war and were decorated for your trouble. Outright rumor and exaggeration. Anything else? Another pause. I require honesty from my employees, Mr. Feeney. Well, that you pay your oxen better than your men, regardless of their honesty, sir. Harris considers firing him at once and having Baumgartner turf him out to the sidewalk on his ear. Yet it was a well-constructed jab, true in a sense, and it took panache. I've yet to hear an ox complain, Harris says. Even so, I assure you, if you perform your duties to my satisfaction, you'll be well rewarded, much better than for hauling booms to my mills. Now, does that interest you, sir? It does, Feeney says, chastened by the almighty dollar. That settles it then, Harris says, clapping his hands. But before I tender my final decision, I'd like you to select a volume from my bookshelf and read a verse of your choosing. Here's Feeney rise and shuffle about. For a moment, Harris fears he's leaving the office until there's a leathery sigh from the chair and the sound of leafing pages. Then, without preamble, Feeney commences. Harris identifies the verse instantly, some Tennyson, a fine and unusual choice of Tennyson, but more than the words, it's the voice, a sweet, exalting instrument that ensnares him. It's a mere cousin to the man's speaking voice, though an elevation of it. The clean tone of a stringed instrument. A cello, yes, that's it. Yet more expressive, sopping with life. His vowels and consonants fitting together as neat as a joined wood box. Baumgartner often checks prospective lumbermen like livestock before he hires them, examining their teeth and engaging the tint of their eyes beside a sheet of white cardstock. 
And while Harris knows that the blind often pass their hands over a person's features to gather a sense of them, he's never performed such an imposition on anyone. It's always seemed like a vulgar act, a groping admission of his enfeeblement. Yet for the first time in his life, Harris wishes he could feel the face of Liam, Liam Feeney, this man whom he's picked to be his describer, this bearer of a voice more arresting than anything he's ever encountered. You're hired, Harris says brusquely after Feeney's reading is done. So don't you ever talk to me like that again. <laughs> Um, yeah. So, <laughs> this is, a, it's, it's, after the book has come out, I've been uh, talking a lot about climate change, uh, mostly in interviews that comes up. I feel woefully uh, unqualified uh, as a scientist to speak about climate change, but I've done my best, um, because this book is also concerned with climate change and with uh, the human beings' impact upon the planet's ecology. Um, uh, and so uh, I actually have been invited to three different writers' festivals in Australia this year. Uh, so I have to make three separate trips, uh, which is going to be probably poor me. But yeah, uh, but it's, it's interesting and it's sad uh, more, than any, more than interesting to see something that I thought up four years ago in the Great Withering, uh, you know, manifesting itself. You see those photos of, you know, children, the ash in, you know, the, the bushfires uh, in Australia, and it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a terrible, it's a terrible thing. But uh, it's something that I think writers, I'm often surprised when writers aren't writing about climate change. Uh, because it's such a presence in my mind um, constantly. So, um, so it's a story of nature. It's a story of interconnection, mainly. It's a story of family as well. Um, you'll see that many of the Greenwoods um, come to become Greenwoods not necessarily through birth, uh, which is kind of one of the themes of, of the novel in the sense that there's a quote that's very that's sort of near the end that says, um, uh, "A family is not a tree; it's it's a forest," um, which I think is is, is very interesting. Um, and, and writing this book was part of my way of challenging the notion of the family tree. Anytime I've read those epic novels that I love, you know, when you see that that tree in the first pages, so you know what the hell's going on. Um, those trees leave out so many people. You know, you think about the branches that ought to come off and how that tree, the tree shape is essentially one we've invented. I mean, you know, those, what about those people's ancestors? What about the mostly women who just kind of come into this male-dominated family tree and uh, everyone's got this one name uh, that is in essence meaningless. I mean, I, I recently discovered uh, my last name, uh, my great-grandfather was adopted. We just found this out. Um, so essentially, I'm not a Christie. I've had this word attached to me, right? I mean, what am I? I don't, I, you know, you're the product of how many, 16? More as you go back? So I really wanted to challenge and push against this notion of family as a thing, as a tree, or as a knowable structure. Uh, and, and, and this novel does that, hopefully. Um, going to do, this one may be a little bit of a spoiler. Should I not do it? It won't be too bad, though. It's okay. Um, this is going to be from the very middle of the book. I won't read anything from the last half of the book, where that's where things really start to, start to heat up. Um, this is from the opening of the 1908 section, which is the very center of the book, of which there is only one. Um, it's... it's and this, this chapter is called um, heartwood, uh, which is the term for the, the central wood of a tree. Um, and it's told in the voice, in the, the we collective voice of a small town in southern Ontario who are witness to a terrible tragedy.
One is subject to much talk nowadays concerning family trees and roots and bloodlines and such. As if a family tree were a, as if a family were an eternal fact, a continuous branching upwards through time immemorial. But the truth is that all family lines, from the highest to the lowest, originate somewhere on some particular day. Even the grandest trees must have once been seeds spun helpless on the wind, and then just meek saplings nosing up from the soil. We know this for certain, because on the night of April 29th, 1908, a family took root before our eyes. We awoke to the apocalypse itself. The tremor flung the dishes from our cupboards and unhitched the frames from our walls. Two 20-car passenger trains had collided head-on a mile east of our township. The westbound locomotive's tender caught fire, and the flames passed from one train to the other, and hours went by before we could push our water wagons deep enough into the oily coal smoke to douse the blaze. The fire left a gruesome scene. Skulls studded with black teeth, indistinguishably charred appendages intermixed with twists of contorted iron and torched garments. A proper accounting of the dead was impossible, but of the 16 passengers thrown from the train's windows on impact, the sole survivors were two young boys. Both left barefoot by the tremendous force of the crash, one discovered tangled deep in the brush, the other floundering in a nearby brook. Both were near nine years of age, by our reckoning, and even after hours of hunting, we never found a single shoe. Our town physician determined that it was their small statures that saved them, the way a squirrel can plunge from a tree and skitter off unharmed. Either that, or as was claimed by the more speculative among us, something evil and unkillable resided in them both. Still, that the boys escaped such a cataclysm seemed as much a miracle then as it does now. We sent word of the two survivors to the CN Railway Company, who maintained they had no record of any children riding either train, so they bore no responsibility for any that happened to be found in the vicinity of the accident. While it was upsetting business to face the young victims of such tragedy, it was our rail junction and our octogenarian switchmen who effectively <coughs> orphaned them. So after our failed efforts to locate any surviving, surviving family, we appraised the boys as our responsibility and assumed their charge. Matters were handled differently in those days, and lost people circulated as unnoticed as slight gusts of wind. Though the ordeal had rendered both boys mute, it was immediately clear that the mysterious pair shared no blood. One was slightly shorter, with dark, wavy hair and almond eyes that always avoided your own. And yet he had an easy, almost carefree way of moving about the world, despite what he'd suffered. The taller one had long fingers and thick, honey-colored hair. And that one would meet anyone's gaze with a shrewdly appraising glare, as though even our rescue had been some kind of trick, a further continuation of the disaster that had befallen them. Yet despite their outward differences, we figured those two boys were better off kept together and billeted them with several charitable homesteads in the area while we waited futilely for someone to claim them. It's well established that the recollections of youngsters are about as reliable as rainbows. This is especially true, we learned, of the recently orphaned. When after a week the boys finally spoke, the difficulty wasn't that they'd forgotten their names, it was that they drummed up too many a junk shop of surnames and given names, all mumbled and jumbled together. Tommy, Mackenzie, Buck, Smith, Finnegan, Seymour, Gordon, Aaron. Perhaps the impact had scrambled their heads. Or perhaps their true names had become too painful to utter now that their families were dead. But our only remedy was to jot them all down on scraps of paper and pull two from a coffee can and get on with it. Concerning their pasts, the blonde one, for whom we pulled Harris, could recall only fragments, sheep, five or six sisters, an uncle, rain pattering, a metal shed roof, a smoky hearth. The darker boy, for whom we pulled Everett, 
recalled slimy fish knives, a barking man with no hair at all, a sickly mother, a wireless that never worked. Beneath the overpowering stink of burnt horsehair cushions and immolated flesh must have lingered the traces of their lost homes and families, still caught in the fibers of their sweaters and the linings of their nostrils. Yet each passing day must have left those traces a little weaker, further confused, less distinct. And soon their pasts withered away completely, and all that remained was haze and hearsay. It was shortly after we named them that we began discovering their beds empty in the night. Our townspeople took up naphtha lanterns and tracked them into the woods. We found the boys cowering and clutching each other in their bedclothes we had given them beneath a wide spreading tree, muttering in an unsettling shared tongue. When this was repeated over several nights, we were near ready to shove those boys back on an outbound train and be done with it. And given how things turned out, Lately, we can't help but wonder if it was a mistake that we didn't. It was Parson Brennan who took note that whenever the boys absconded, it was often to one particular woodlot, an otherwise vacant plot officially owned by Mrs. Fiona Craig. We still can't say why this was. Perhaps they were drawn to the old trapper's hut they discovered there, a rotten win windowless shack once used, it was rumored, to harbor runaway slaves from the United States. Or perhaps it was some comforting aspect of the woods themselves, which were thick with oak and maple, foxglove and trillium, elderberry and chokecherry. Especially after they started taking to the woods, there was something otherworldly and haunted about the pair. So while many of us could have used some extra hands around our properties, none volunteered to take the boys on a permanent basis. As a last resort, we proposed to Mrs. Craig that she allow their habitation in that hut on her woodlot. The township would provide her with a yearly sum to house and feed them until they came of age. And though the old widow had no offspring of her own and wasn't exactly what you'd call the caretaking type, we were pleasantly surprised when she agreed. too much. It's really not. There's more. <laughs> it's a big book. There are a lot of secrets to be had. Um, but I think, I think we should open it up to questions. I, I really, I, I love taking questions. I don't know if there are any out there. I could start asking myself questions. Yes? yes. Where did the original idea for the book come from? Um, a, a number of places. Often for me, it's sort of a bunch of things that are present in my life and all sort of congeal and, 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 and meld together. Um, here are a few of them. Uh, my wife's name is Cedar, number one. <laughs> no, she, who, she grew up on Galliano Island uh, with hippie parents, um, lived in a house her father built. Five years ago, her folks gave us a piece of their property, uh, and we moved there on it. Uh, we brought down a bunch of the trees on the land. Um, two guys milled the wood, uh, milled the logs into wood for us. Their names were Gordy and Gord. Very Canadian, very Canadian experience. Uh, they milled the wood, and then I proceeded to build a house. Uh, I'd done some construction in the past. I hired a guy who knew what he was doing to work with me, uh, and we built uh, this small house on Galliano, which is where we live now, out of the wood that was standing uh, on the property. And so that was part of it. Me, my work with trees, living in a forested place like Galliano was a big part of it. Um, uh, also, I, I really wanted, I love uh, when uh, a book can, Communicate that conversation between generations is something that I've noticed in my own life. You know, in this book, it's funny because the there's a timber baron. What does his daughter become? A radical environmentalist. What does her son become? A carpenter. Uh, and it just kind of rolls on. And I really loved. I wanted to kind of demonstrate that 
intergenerational conversation that goes on and this passing down and also uh, rebelling uh, that happens between generations that I've seen in my family and, and I've seen in other families as well. So um, I guess it was a bunch of things, but I'll say my wife's name as the simplified version. <laughs> question. Have you considered writing for children about intergenerational uh, transmission? Uh, and no, because now that I read so much fi children's fiction and have read so much, you know, right from board books to now we're into the YA fiction, um, I've really gained an appreciation for how difficult it is to do well, because I've read so much bad, bad <laughs> stuff. And it's shockingly bad, and I couldn't even tell you why it's so bad. You know, um, children's fiction I think contains this magic, like, and I don't, I wouldn't know where to start to get it. Um, so I would say I'm not, a, I'm not a, I'm not good enough to write <laughs> children's fiction, or at least I need to. I'm a little bit more long-winded, uh, 500 pages worth. But I, I, I think that as a topic. I mean, particularly like intergenerational trauma is a very interesting uh, subject that a lot of writers are exploring now and I think to great result. But also, yeah, just that that passing down uh, through generations is, is, would be make a great children's book. I'm sure people are already doing it. in the plotting did I know about the tree ring structure? So I begin, I, I, I'm sort of a collagist in a way. I kind of had, I had a bunch of stories that I felt were related, but I didn't know how they were going to be related until this tree, and this tree thing happened. And I, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm usually a disbeliever in epiphanies, but this one was a genuine <laughs> epiphany. And <clears throat> I have an agent who is also a writer. He's a very amazing writer. At, I called him up and I told him, I have a structure for my book. It's going to be like the rings of a tree. And he's like sort of a New York guy. And he was like, don't tell anyone that. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, why? He's like, I can't believe you just told me that. Um, because it's, it's, a good, it feel, it's a good idea. And no one has done it before. And I, it was, as soon as I kind of happened upon it, the book started to hang together and it fell together. And it, I love, I love books that teach you how to read them as you're going and, and you know when you're beginning this book you have the sense of this history that you're about to plunge into um, and without that structure you might not know it's coming uh, and so I, I, I like it for that reason so, yeah. um, do you start writing um, do you start writing it before you actually have the whole story or do you have the whole story in your head before you actually start writing it down? That's a great question. Do I start writing, do I have the whole story in my head um, before I start writing, or do I make it up as a go along, yeah, essentially? So, yeah. I could not hold this story in my head. Okay. My head is probably actually smaller than this book. Um, I, I'm very much of a, a feel it out kind of writer. That being said, I do a lot of structuring particularly like later in the project, once I sort of understand what story I'm actually trying to tell. Um, I have a little 10 by 10 writing cabin shed. CBC, the Globe and Mail came to my property on Galliano and interviewed me. And then the interviewer was like, oh, he writes in a shed. <laughs> it's like, a shed. We, yeah. It's like, we call it a cabin. <laughs> it's 10 by 10, sure, it's not a big cabin. <laughs> So I write in the cabin, um, and it is beyond the reach of Wi-Fi, which is very, very important to me, and I don't bring my phone in there. It's like phone-free zone, which is critical for me to get anything done. Um, but the walls of that cabin were plastered with timelines, baby development. There's a baby in this book that grows up throughout the book, so like stages of development. like. 
Depression era research, just tons and tons of maps and graphs. And, and so, but I don't begin with that stuff. I don't begin with the maps and the graphs and the timelines. I begin with a feeling, a character, usually uh, sort of a sense. Some of my favorite epic novels. Let me think here. Recently, um, I read a book called Homegoing by Yav Kiyasi. Kiyasi, her name is, and it it delves back. It begins sort of in on the Ivory Coast, sort of in the beginning of the slave trade, and then follows one family's life through to contemporary America, and it is astounding. Like I was just like, wow. And I think, um, and other ones, Grapes of Wrath, I just wrote a big thing about the Grapes of Wrath, which is the first great climate change novel, uh, yeah. I am asserting. Um, if you think about it, there are people fleeing an, a man-made environmental disaster, uh, migrants within their own country seeking a better life, and they're turned away by people who are already there. It's a pretty familiar story, I think, now. <laughs> Um, so that novel I've always loved, uh, 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 East of Eden is a big influence on this book. I love um, the brothers. Um, yeah, that's all I can think of this time. Can I have a question? Yes. Yeah, um, first of all, congratulations on that success of the book. Thank like you. It's Just watching you do the baby dance makes me kind of want to do the baby dance. Yeah, I do it even when I'm not holding it. Do you? Yeah. It's, really, um, it's hard. My wife is a writer as well, and she has a book coming out next year that you all should get. It's better than my book. Um, um, and so we, we structure uh, our lives around it. I mean, um, the big part is for me anyway, is like learning to be doing what you're doing at the time you're doing it. And that, by that I mean when you're with the kids, get the phone out of there, be with the kids. And then when you're writing, really write. Don't half write, don't half be there. And that I found, even with the limited amount of time that I have, it really maximized the time that I do use to, to write. Um, uh, other than that, gets better, <laughs> you will sleep later. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough, tough thing. But I, I did find that having kids really kind of crystallized for me what matters in my life. I mean, what I care about, what kind of future I want to leave for them. I think I think much more about environmental stuff, you know, societal, you know, uh, how we're doing uh, much more than I did previously, and so um, I care about more now. So that helps. Yes. What is your wife's name so we can look for her book when it comes out? Her, her last name is Bowers, so her name is Cedar Bowers, <laughs> and the title is still up in the air. Bowers, B O W E R S. Yeah, yeah. And it's being published by McClellan and Stewart as well. We have the same publisher. I became a writer um, because skateboarding didn't, uh, <laughs> didn't work out. No, yeah, no, it panned out. I mean, there's a there's a life cycle for a pro skateboarder. But uh, no, I always loved reading. I, that was my escape. It was my uh, way of understanding the world. I feel like I, you know, I'm constantly reading. I love books. And it came from a very just kind of organic place of, I love literature, what if I could make one? I want to make one, why not? Um, and coming from Thunder Bay, it was a little bit difficult to believe that um, I could be the kind of person who would make a book. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, I haven't looked back since. It's much better than you know jumping down staircases and that kind of thing. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I don't think I don't think I, I've had a whole bunch of different jobs as well. I've worked in construction. I've worked in homeless shelters. I've worked uh, in mental health. Uh, and this particular job suits me the most, I'd say. Did, well, I, I got into the, I, I'd never shown my writing to anyone in my life. Uh, the first thing I published was in Thrasher Magazine, which was very great. I'm the only person probably who's been published in the New York Times and Thrasher Magazine. <laughs> um, I wrote a story, I wrote a series of stories, um, and on a lark, uh, sent off an application to the MFA program at UBC, the Creative Writing Master's Program. And they don't look at your marks, they only look at your, uh, at your manuscript, luckily for me, and I got in. And I'd never taken a writing class in my life. I'd never really even spoken to anyone other than my mom about books and literature. Uh, and I got in and I went, uh, and there wasn't any particular person um, there, although Linda Svensson, who's a great short story writer who teaches there, was my advisor and she, you know, uh, was amazing. But just the going to a writing program like that, it isn't about as much about what people tell you in terms of advice, it's more about feeling the authority to write and say, you know, you see a writer and you're like, this is a human being, you know, they're walking around and breathing air and they're just a person. Uh, I can do this too. Um, that's, and that, for me it was transformative. I never missed a day, which if you saw my high school attendance <laughs> record, would surprise me. Yeah. Hi, Michael. It seems like uh, you've been interviewed a lot. I'm just wondering who your favorite uh, interviewer is and or interview. Um, wow, this is, a tough, this is a very loaded question. I just did an interview with Jason. Um, he's looking... A lot bigger than me. Right. Yeah, that's. I put a cushion under my chair, so I. Didn't. I was being kind of funny, but uh, is there like, um, besides me an interview that really stands It's a it's a tie of you and Carol off. I recently did as it happens, and just to hear her voice is just so. I mean, it's one of those voices that are so iconic. I, She's speaking in my house, you know, every day, essentially. And to hear that voice addressing you, it's, um, it's very surreal. Uh, and there was a, and, and she loved the book, and she was very, uh, <clears throat> she had a lot of insight into the book as well. So that was probably the best. So, so it's a tie. It's a tie between you and Carol. <laughs> yeah. It's a tie. Thank you. Dead tie. Yeah. <laughs> starting to grow and I'm wondering what's next. Well, in terms of, yeah, what I'm going to be... What are you thinking about next? I think you mentioned earlier that I was very cagey and secretive yes. previously. Very I'm going to do it again. Yeah. Uh, I have a, two ideas and I'm just kind of testing them to see which one I'm really going to try to sink um, my energies into. I know this is very vague and very boring. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but... Yeah, that's all I got. Yeah. Yeah. It'll it'll you know, it'll be similar. And, yeah. I just one question. Did you know your book was put in the subscription box? If you know what that is. I saw that on Instagram. That's how I actually got is that it. How you that's got how I got your book because I read thrillers ninety nine percent of the time. I would never have picked this out if I hadn't gotten the box. But it is, I'm only three quarters of the way through, but it is an amazing, amazing story, and I'm loving it. And so I didn't know if you knew that they'd actually put it in once, and that's how it I, got out. So there's folks who package up books with other gifts and yes. just beautiful things, and you can subscribe to the subscription and you get a box, and it's got a book paired with all kinds of stuff. It's sort of like a pairing Yeah, so thing. like, and, and yeah, this is the one they, and it's, and they, it's amazing. 
yeah, there's like pine scented candles. And I saw that. I was like, this, this, I want this box. No, it came with this. It came with yeah. the necklace I'm wearing. Oh, yeah, the necklace came in with trees on it. And it comes with like a candle that wow. smells like trees. So like, yeah. it was all connected with, but yeah, I would never have read this book if it hadn't been for that. And it was amazing. And they picked in a brilliant book. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah. That's, I did. I saw that. Good. <laughs> I should also point out that this is the the most sustainably published book uh, by Penguin Random House of all time. There's a big uh, blurb in the back of it, um, like all the paper that we used while we even when we were editing, like the manuscript paper and stuff was all ancient forest certified. And they knew, and because I insisted, uh, that they really needed to do this book in a way um, that was as sustainable. As as they could, and, and they did do that. So it's something I'm very proud of.